webinar so that it can be uploaded at a later date. Uh, it did not go. Uh, start recording. Oh, there it goes. Uh, so we are now recording. Thank you all for being here. Uh, we are really excited to have you here today and really excited for the topics that are going to be discussed. We have a really great slate of speakers uh, and some amazing things to learn from one another. And so I'm going to give it just a couple minutes to let people trickle in, but we have a lot that we want to cover. And so we're going to start on time. So thanks for being here. Thanks for being on time. Uh, I ask that everyone that is joining, if you're able, please mute your microphone. Uh, we will be patrolling that participants list and muting people uh, during the uh, presentations, but there will be an opportunity for you to unmute yourself uh, and discuss at the end for our discussion period. But we ask that you um, let our presenters have their space uh, while they're able. Uh, and we are also going to ask everyone to turn their videos off during the presentations to save on bandwidth but that you'll be welcome to turn your video back on when we start into that discussion. So I'm just going to give it one more minute before we uh, get started. Thank you again for being here. So let's get started. So I wanted to just first off uh, do some housekeeping as always. Uh, my name is Colleen Sanders and I am the Climate Adaptation Planner for the Confederated Tribes of the Matilla Indian Reservation. Uh, and I'm really excited to have you here on our third webinar in our webinar series. Uh, and I am hoping that you can see some slides that say housekeeping notes in the share. Um, feel free to unmute yourself and say, hey, I can't see anything or your slides aren't working. Uh, if you see a problem, that would be um, more than acceptable. Uh, and I wanted to really thank uh, Aaron Warden for being our moderator here today. Uh, he's the one who's admitting you into the lobby from the lobby and will be monitoring kind of uh, the mute functions as will I. Uh, the chat box is always open during this webinar, and so we were hoping that you'll engage with us a little bit more through that chat box um, and uh, feel free to participate in a discussion or ask questions as they kind of pop into your mind. We are going to save questions uh, for all presenters to the end, uh, but we will have a chance to discuss and a chance to really um, share our own perspectives at that time. Uh, and so again, I want to always remind people that we are looking forward to the future. And so we're always looking for uh, positive and proactive uh, discussions and responses. Uh, and that if you want to during the uh, discussion period, feel free to use that raise hand function if you want to let me know that you want to say something. Or if your mic is unmuted, I will call on you. So watch for that and you can feel free to unmute yourself in the discussion period uh, if you want to share. And so I think with that, I'm going to uh, turn it over to our board vice chair, board of trustees vice chair, Jeremy Wolf, to give our in opening invocation. Uh, thank you, Colleen. <clears throat> uh, my name is uh, Jeremy Wolf. Uh, it's a little built. Um, it's an honor to give an uh, invocation. Uh, I just wanted to share. Uh, a quote. I've uh, been doing some other research for another uh, first foods fish and wildlife effort and came across this this just this morning and um, reread it and seemed appropriate uh, after Colleen asked me to to do the invocation this morning. <clears throat> I wonder if the ground has anything to say. I wonder if the ground is listening to what is said. I wonder if the ground would come alive and what is on it. Though I hear what the ground says, the ground says it is the great spirit that placed me here. The great spirit tells me to take care of the Indians, to feed them all right. The great spirit appointed the roots to feed the Indians, 
the water says the same thing. The great spirit directs me feed the Indians well. The ground, water and grass say the great spirit has given us our names. We have these names and hold these names. The ground says the great spirit has placed me here to produce all that grows on me, trees and fruit. The same way the ground says it was from me, man was made. The great spirit in place in men on the earth desired them to take good care of the ground, to do each other no, no harm. Young chief from the 1855 Treaty Council. So reading that, I am uh, pleased to see how we have taken these lessons of the past, lessons that uh, were, were um, passed on generation to generation of of uh, our travels and the foods that we must take care of, the um, sacrifices they, they made for us to be here. And those elders, those, those people who sacrificed so much for us to even be here. So with that, I just wanted to say thank you to all of them and to th say thank you and Kaitsiao to you for being here and, and thinking about these things and wanting to be a part of um, their future. That's all. Thank you. That was fantastic. Um, with that, I am going to uh, share just a second. The PowerPoint. Give me a second. Sorry for any technical difficulties. So. This is the third webinar in our webinar series, and uh, it is an opportunity for us to um, talk about impacts to the indigenous food system, not just for foods, but the way that we access them and the way that we incorporate them into our lives. And so our last webinar was focused solely on water, uh, surface waters and groundwaters. And so now we move to the first foods availability and access part of our adaptation plan for the next three or four webinars. And so I am really excited to have our slate of speakers here today. We're gonna start off with talking about salmon. We're gonna start with the, the serving order. Uh, and um, salmon, of course, is the first of the fish species. And so we're gonna have uh, Gary James, program manager for the fisheries program, uh, talk with us, as well as Jeremiah Bonifer, uh, who is the assistant project leader on the Umatilla Basin Monitoring and Evaluation Project. From there, we're going to talk about lamprey, our beautiful Pacific lamprey. Uh, and we have Aaron Jackson, who is the acting project leader of the lamprey project. Uh, and then we're going to make sure that we talk about our freshwater mussels. Uh, and so we're really excited and um, privileged to have Donna Nez, who is project technician for the freshwater mussel project. Uh, and then we're going to round it out with um, some discussions about treaty rights issues and access issues with uh, Bud Herrera has some uh, perspectives and stories that he wants to share as a member of the Fish and Wildlife Commission. And I'm going to give these fine folks their own opportunity to introduce themselves uh, at the head of their discussion. And I wanted to just let you know that when we were setting this webinar up, each one of these people could speak for an hour about their issues. And so we're really fortunate to get to have this overview here. And we might run a little bit long with each of the speakers, but we're so blessed to be able to have their knowledge and their expertise in the room today. And so with that, I am going to, without further ado, pass this over to Gary James. So take it away, Gary. Okay, I hope everybody can hear me. Yes, we can hear you. All right. We see your slides as well. Um, how do I? I I'm, I'm trying to call up a different presentation. Um, you might have to stop sharing and then find your presentation and then share it again. No, we're, where, where's the sharing? So it was the same button that you pressed. It's going to have an X instead of an arrow this time. Yeah, it's not there this time. Okay, Interesting. I'll, I'll, share. Just, I'll just proceed. <clears throat> okay, Gary James, Tribal Fisheries Program Manager. Um, been here a long time, uh, 39 years, I think. So seen a lot. We've accomplished a lot, but boy, we got a lot more uh, long ways to go. Um, 
This presentation today, I'm going to cover briefly our mission and goals and, and a little bit on our program. And then it's important to understand the general status of Columbia River salmon. You know, if we got climate change coming, we, we've already been dealt a difficult hand. So a little summary there. Uh, a, a tie to river vision, first food river vision, our projects are, I'll summarize that. And then a, a, a little bit of detail on some aspects of the program and fish passage, flow enhancement, floodplain restoration and hatchery actions. Our mission statement is to protect, restore, and enhance the first foods that Colleen spoke of and, and do that utilizing traditional ecological and cultural knowledge and science to inform population and habitat management and also policy and regulatory mechanisms. So the fisheries program uh, mission is to sustain, provide sustainable harvest opportunities, exercise that treaty right for, for fisheries by conserving and restoring the populations, fish populations and their habitats. So we have different uh, branches of the fisheries program. Habitat, we seek to protect and restore. Artificial propagation, we use a hatchery tool to, to put fish back or to supplement, enhance them. There's research and monitoring to evaluate how well all these programs are working. And again, ultimately we're, we're shooting for harvest, augmenting harvest as per our mission. So you look at the serving order of the first foods, and, and that's the basis for our program. Eric has authored some good papers on first food and river vision, which is the basis of the DNR mission statements and, and our direction for our projects. So the fisheries program deals obviously with water and salmon, <clears throat> the first two first foods. And Eric uh, published a paper on river vision with uh, several other offers, uh, authors, and it uh, describes what a healthy, ecologically functioning floodplain looks like and should be. And there's some different, call them categories of health. Hydrology, geomorphology, connectivity, riparian, and then the biota. And, and so those are aspects that we recognize in planning, implementing, and monitoring all of our projects. And again, we're doing this to uh, seek that mission of providing more first foods, fish to the tribe travel use. So a little bit on the fisheries program. Our projects cover all of Northeast Oregon, Southeast Washington, a lot of sub basins, headquarters here in Mission. We have field offices in, in the, the John Day, Grand Ron and Wall Wall basins. Uh, our staffing uh, started low. We're up to about 70 staff, about 30 projects, 20 million a year, and, and a little over half the staff is tribal members. I think it's important to understand <clears throat> a little bit the overall status of Columbia Basin salmon. Uh, the basin's been developed a lot. There's over a thousand dams in the basin, 13 main stem Columbia and snake dams, and only 55% of the once available habitats there today. And then about 65 of that habitat is in the form of reservoirs and pools, you know, dammed reservoirs. And then you get to the tributaries and there's excessive channelization and floodplain development, which has really impacted our water quality and quantity and the complexity of the fish habitat. So you look at a map of the Columbia and this gray area is where fish never were. The Columbia Basin is huge, goes to Canada, Montana, uh, ranches into Wyoming. So the gray areas were always blocked, but these pink salmon colored areas were uh, rendered inaccessible by man due to uh, some of these dams. So that's a lot of area no longer accessible. And so the yellow and green is accessible, but the slashed areas, those are areas where fish remaining are listed under the Endangered Species Act as threatened or endangered, which is pretty much everywhere else. An encouraging thing, this green zone here above La Grande is the Umatilla and Walla Walla Basin where the accessibility has been reestablished. And it's the tribe's programs that's been behind the reintroductions there I'll talk about a little bit. So when you look at fish, they have a complicated life history. They go to the ocean and back. Salmon, lamprey, and sturgeon all do it. And so we've got to be cognizant of tributary habitat conditions uh, where the adults spawn and the juveniles begin to rear and they move downstream in the Columbia and to the estuary and the ocean and come all the way back. So in the context of climate change, boy, um, the in potential impacts are huge across all that broad geographic area. And, and so salmon 
uh, and these anadromous fish go to the ocean back are particularly very sensitive to water quality and uh, quantity and quality changes that could be highly influenced by climate change. So what's happened in these uh, uh, Columbia tributaries, there's been a major loss in the habitat quality and quantity. And a lot of times two spawners don't even replace themselves. And when that happens, your populations go backwards and 23 populations in the Columbia have become extinct and 176 are ESA listed. That's a lot. It's estimated there used to be 15 million or so salmon in the Columbia. We're down to about a tenth of that now and about 80% of that number is hatchery fish. So we've, I covered all that to point out that we've got a difficult situation already prior to this potential climate change impacts. But our large program is trying to address and build back the habitat and some of these, these fish populations as per our mission statement. So this map shows in, in the, this area of activity that the tribe pro projects encompass in Northeast Oregon, Southeast Washington, the green triangles are a habitat project. The largest part of our program is this floodplain restoration. We have those all over the place uh, flow and passage projects concentrate more in the lower Umatilla Walla Walla where there's extensive agriculture. Hatchery projects that, uh, um, are located in Umatilla Walla Grand Ronde to try to supplement uh, the populations that are depressed. And there's lamprey and mussel projects. And you'll hear about those more later. And then there's monitoring and evaluation, our m and &E, uh, of all these actions in all those locations. And a lot of basins, we have all these actions going on at the same time, like Umatilla and Walla Walla have been heavily developed from headwaters to the mouth. So we've got passage and flow and floodplain and hatcheries, and we're monitoring and evaluating, hopefully to head for that harvest goal. So you look back to our, our river vision, our First Foods River Vision mission, and all these uh, categories of fisheries project activities tie right back to some of those, one or several of those River Vision touchstones. So, so it's not just a mission, we're really applying it and understanding the, the, uh, the habitat and the fish needs. So I'll give an overview in these categories of projects that, that aren't covered by the others coming up, fish passage flow, uh, floodplain restoration and hatchery operations. So to start with, with passage, this is a map of the Umatilla, and it just shows a gauntlet of irrigation diversions in the, in the lower basin. The Walla Walla is the same way. So uh, um, 20, 30 years ago when this program started, all the facilities, ladders and screens, they were lacking or very insufficient to protect fish. And the tribe has implemented uh, fixes, you know, sponsored mainly through Bonneville Power Funding. Uh, 20 projects, uh, uh, fish ladder and screen projects to Im improve passage in the lower Umatilla and Walla Walla. <clears throat> and then another aspect of passage is 12 barriers, dams, culvert, road crossings. There's some pictures, examples of some of those. So what's the relationship of these passage projects to climate adaptation? Well, obviously there's going to be increased juvenile adult fish survival uh, fr from these improvements and very uh, in, uh, notable increase in the habitat availability or accessibility. And that will hopefully counter the anticipated uh, impact of climate change, which might reduce the available habitat. So here's an action that's ongoing to expand available habitat access. So on the flow enhancement, in the Umatilla Basin in the, in the 90s, the Umatilla Basin project was implemented. It was a uh, project which pumped Columbia River water to irrigators in exchange for leaving the Umatilla River water in channel. And uh, a map here showing the Umatilla River real quick, this, this bold blue line shows a river with water in it, but the water used to be pulled out to fill Cold Springs Reservoir and at Westland it's pulled out and we these dashed lines represent an intermittent or dewatered river. Down here in this lower left picture shows the main stem Umatilla and then between these trees is actually the, the river channel that's entirely dry. All the water's going down Westland Canal here. 
so water would <clears throat> would have return flows back to the channel. We'd get a river, and then the next irrigation diversion, there it goes again. We have an intermittent river and down to the mouth, same thing. So it was just a back and forth river. So this is a post project example. The red shows water being pumped from the Columbia to these various irrigation districts and, and Cold Springs Reservoir. So now we have a bold line, uh, continuous water, and it also freed 50 miles up, uh, half of Mackay storage. So we have about 30,000 acre feet of water to release for critical fish, you know, rearing and passage periods. In the Walla Walla, we're planning something similar. We're not there yet, but there has been some initial improvements of flow. This is just below Milton Freewater. The river was traditionally dry in the summer, but there, there's been some actions to at least get some flows. That's not all that we need, but again, we're working on it. So the flow uh, project relationships, obviously more flow will increase the habitat quality and quantity, increase the survival, and the anticipated impacts of climate is going to be maybe less flow during critical times and, and uh, uh, worsen quality as far as temperatures. So hopefully that will buffer those anticipated uh, fisheries climate cause impacts. So on to watershed habitat restoration. Different activities, there's major land acquisitions and floodplain channel improvements working both in stream and riparian. And this is just an example uh, of a project here. I'll get into more detail. Our land acquisition, we try to acquire strongholds for protection and enhancement. Looking glass examples on the upper lower left is Grand Ron, and then lower right is uh, South Fork Tushi rainwater area. So five acquisitions have been done so far, 4,000 acres Grand Ronde and uh, 160 in the Umatilla and a lot more additional planning is ongoing. So another important aspect of floodplain restoration, we do comprehensive assessments and we look at a river vision based assessment, assessing the health of those, those touch tones or those, those categories and we define the limiting factors of what's wrong and, and conceptually define what needs to be done to address those to again provide a self-sustaining, ecologically functioning floodplain with multiple benefits. And most of our floodplains have been channelized through the years. This picture, an, uh, Upper Grand Ron shows a typical project that we're doing major floodplain restoration to put, to put the channel back into the multiple broad channels where it used to be. We've got a lot of existing agreements with landowners. We've done habitat projects for years. We've got over, a little over 100 agreements with landowners covered 138 miles and, and 24,000 acres. Uh, but the bigger projects in, in the last 10 years, we've got another 86 miles uh, of uh, projects like this picture on the right with major floodplain restoration uh, of uh, restoring the channel back to to connect to the to the floodplain this shows a, a a more natural meandering stream the upper left through a valley bottom and because it meanders and has good interaction surface groundwater there's a high water table well, when it's developed and channelized, and probably 80% of our streams of seeded areas channelized, and that channelization comes from ag practices or roads, railroads, urbanization, all those things, um, you get erosion and seismic, and the water table ends up being, you know, 10, 15 feet below. That, that doesn't do much for fish or ag, really. So this shows a, a natural and, and then a, a, a channelized stream. So real quick, Meacham Creek, these red lines used to be pre-60s where Meacham Creek occupied the floodplain. Well, there's a big flood in the 60s and the railroad thought they would, to protect their right of way, they put the channel over to the, the far west side of the channel and locked it in with levees and dikes. It went over here. So we looked at where the former channel used to be and put the stream back. Here's in this picture shows the stream locked in over there and then uh, We've been working on this project for about 10 years, and there's about eight plus miles now of completed project, returning the stream to the natural floodplain. Gary, you have about five minutes yeah. left. Five minutes, okay. 
Here's some more examples of Catherine Creek and the South Fork and the Walla Walla and Toucanon large wood placement. We have a native plant nursery to help jumpstart the riparian restoration with locally adapted plants. It's important to understand the connectivity between ground and surface water. Here's just an example. When you have a complex uh, braided channel with, with islands, and uh, here's the water going in at the top of an island, and it will go subsurface and cool and come out the lower end. And this can't happen when a channel, when a stream is channelized without those complexities. So it's a real cooling mechanism. You may have seen Scott O'Daniel's example. He looked at the Umatilla River. This is the distance. And as he looked at temperatures, they went up and down and up and down. He wondered what's going on here with the temperatures. Then he looked at the complexity of the channel. The complexity had to do with this meandering and a healthy floodplain. When you have a high, high health or high complexity, you have low temperatures. In the converse, um, you have a channelized stream and you immediately see some higher temperatures, a direct relationship there. So we're evaluating all these things. We have a project that looks at, at our, our treated channels and, versus our controlled uh, channelized. And we're looking at the physical and biological changes. And so far we're seeing some, some good changes as far as temperatures and fish uh, abundance and, and use of that habitat. I'm just showing some pictures. We have got our work cut out for us. This is the Grand Ronde Valley. On the right, it used to be meandered. Now it's channelized. We lost 45 stream miles. That's just an extreme example. Here's some more pictures of floodplain development. There is so much more to do in our tributaries. It's a major limiting factor. So what's this going to do for us? Increase habitat quality and quantity, reduce the scour and erosion. It will increase that surface to groundwater exchange that I mentioned. It'll cool water. It'll help store it and slowly release it into the summer and ultimately help the juvenile adult survival. And hopefully all that will buffer those negative impacts that, that uh, are coming from uh, climate change. So the last piece is hatchery operations. We operate 11 hatchery satellite facilities in the Umatilla Wall and Grand Ronde Basins. And those are for juvenile uh, acclimation and release and adult holding and spawning. We release 3 million salmon uh, average a year from all these facilities. And the new Walla Walla hatchery under construction right now is slated to release 500,000 salmon for salmon reintroduction in the Walla Walla Basin. So four of these programs have been reintroduction. We, we've reintroduced Spring Chinook, Fall Chinook Co. and the Umatilla and Spring Chinook and the Walla Walla, where they used to not be. Remember that map with the uh, extinction areas? We're supplementing existing but depressed populations uh, in the Umatilla Steelhead and then Spring Chinook and the Grand Rod. So our acclimation facilities are located high in the basins like the Umatilla, so we imprint them on the spawning habitat. So they return to the gravel. And so we got to maintain that habitat through these various actions and uh, so how does these projects relate to climate? Increased abundance of fish for natural production and harvest. Hopefully that will help counter any uh, increased mortalities due to uh, climate changes. Our monitoring valuation program, Jeremiah is going to get into the, the Umatilla part of this, but we look comprehensively fish in and out of all these sub-basins to evaluate these projects I'm quickly covering. Our goal is harvest. The last three years, we've struggled with low returns, Columbia Basin wide, but before that, we were seeing a good trend of increasing tributary fisheries. Some opportunities in up to nine locations or tributaries a year and general increase in zone six, but, but again, the last few years, we've been challenged there. So that's it, a real quick overview covering the flows, the passage, the floodplain and hatchery improvements all directed at improving the habitat and the populations to provide increase harvest of that first food. That was incredible. Thank you. Um, we're going to hold questions until the end. I'm sure that everybody wants to engage with this. And if you are dying to ask your question, you can go ahead and throw it in the chat and we'll um, make sure that we get to it. Uh, but I want to move quickly along. You uh, gave a perfect segue into Jeremiah's presentation. So Gary, if you want to um, stop sharing. It's going to be the same button that you press to start sharing. Um, and we will have Jeremiah take it away, please. We can see your slides. OK, perfect. Can you hear me also? Yes. OK, perfect. Nick Patchway, Inash Wanisha, Nasipnak Nawitla, Jeremiah Bonifer, 
Uh, good afternoon. My name is Jeremiah Bonifer. I'm a assistant project lead with the Umatilla Basin Monitoring and Evaluation Project here within the Umatilla Basin and the DNR Fisheries Program. Um, thank you for inviting me to, to talk here today. I hope um, I can lend something to the climate change discussion. Um, I'm going to be talking about climate change impacts to salmonid distribution and survival, specifically within uh, the Umatilla Basin. Let's see if I can get this to move on. There we go. So Gary already touched on the fisheries program mission statement and the Umatilla River vision. Um, I wanted to briefly touch on how we tie into that. And so the monitoring and evaluation project's mission is to generate knowledge regarding the biological uh, performance and ecology of aquatic species of the first foods order in a scientifically credible and policy relevant manner to inform management and policy decisions. So we're monitoring and evaluating, collecting data, performing analyses um, so that we can help inform some of our management and policy decisions. Uh, real quick, this is a look at the Umatilla River Basin. Uh, we can see where the uh, reservation boundary falls into that right now. Um, it encompasses multiple drainages um, and, of course, the Umatilla River from um, the headwaters of the North Fork Umatilla down to its confluence at the Columbia River uh, in the town of Umatilla. So, uh, generally, when we're talking about um, salmonids and aquatic first foods, we're, we're talking about water. So, I just wanted to touch really quick on the hydrological modeling that Scott O'Daniel presented in the last webinar series. And uh, what that's predicting for us uh, in the Umatilla Basin is we're going to see higher and earlier winter flows. Um, we're going to see those atmospheric rivers, those real big rainstorms like we got this past February, um, increasing in intensity and frequency. Uh, we're going to see higher high flows and lower low flows in the river, and those can impact um, sedimentation, as like you can see at a, a Shaplish um, uh, Canyon right here where it's real muddy, and it can also uh, create um, higher water temperatures or lower water temperatures in the, um, in the winter time. We're going to see the Umatilla River Basin transition from a snow-based to a rain-based watershed. So we're going to see less of our precipitation falling as snow where it gets released slowly and over a long, longer period of time into our river and uh, more of a, a rain-based where that precipitation is coming down and moving right out of the, uh, out of the basin. So some potential impacts to the Umatilla River, um, aquatic first foods is like I was saying uh, with the hydrological model, we're going to see increased summer water temperatures, uh, likely to see a loss of marginal habitat and a shrinking of suitable habitat. Um, scour events that could lead to red destruction. We had those big floods last year. Um, the timing of those floods coincide with uh, summer steelhead spawning. And when we get those big scour events, we can assume that we're losing some of those reds. Uh, reduced harvest opportunities, either from poor river conditions or low anadromous uh, returns. Um, poor river conditions, uh, if we've got these consistent high flows or extremely low flows at those times when we're out there trying to harvest first foods, those could really impact our opportunities. Um, uh, temperature dependent incubation and emergence disruption. So when our salmon and steelhead and resident um, fish spawn, um, the time that those eggs are in incubation to the time that they emerge as fry um, is temperature dependent. And if we see a disruption in that, we could see a disruption in the out migration of those smolts and the ocean entry of those juveniles, uh, which can severely impact uh, the survival. Um, increases in sedimentation could reduce egg survival and later foraging efficacy. So uh, we could see the possibility that some of our reds get smothered uh, with all the sediment that comes out. Uh, and then most of our fish here in the, in the Umatilla River Basin are site feeders. And if we've got real turbid, real dirty, silty water, they're going to struggle to find food. And then also we're going to see um, decreased monitoring and observation um, opportunities. And what I mean by that is uh, when we've got conditions where we can't go out and monitor our resources, we're, ris uh, we're really lowering our ability to adaptively manage and report on those resources and find ways to um, manage those so that they continue. Uh, get more specific into um, potential impacts from increasing water temperatures and spring Chinook. Uh, we could see increases in pre-spawn mortality as adults. Uh, pre-spawn mortality 
is where we see those returning adults um, expiring or dying before they have a chance to spawn and contribute to that next generation. Uh, we're likely to see a loss of cold water refugia, uh, areas where um, our anadromous fish or our resident fish can go to escape those warmer waters. Uh, changes in spawning distribution, the, uh, the available suitable habitat for spawning to actually take place. Uh, we could see changes in food web dynamics. As waters warm, we know that we've got populations of invasive warm water uh, species in the lower river, and if their range expands further upriver into uh, warmer waters where they're finding more suitable habitat, we could see a, a direct impact on our food web dynamics. We could see tr uh, changes in our trap and haul operations. If we're having to trap and haul more fish, and depending on where we've got to trap and haul them to, we could see some impacts to harvest opportunities. Uh, again, harvest opportunities, um, either from poor river conditions, poor fishing opportunities, um, or just uh, simply uh, the quality of those fish. We could see those first food qualities go down as we have war warmer water temperatures um, we see the condition and the, and the food quality of, of those first foods go down. So as a, um, a more solid example of how water temperature and pre-spawn mortality um, go together, uh, lower flows, especially low summer flows, generally mean a high water temperatures. Um, Spring Chinook generally begin to experience uh, temperature-induced stress around 18 degrees Celsius or 64 degrees Fahrenheit. And what we see here, this was from a presentation in 2006 uh, uh, of the Umatilla Basin River Basin, but it still holds very true today. Um, if we look at the um, lower, the x-axis, this is our water temperatures, and the y-axis is the percentage of that run um, that die prematurely, they die before spawning. If we look at the uh, 20 degree Celsius where that line intersects, we're seeing roughly 20% uh, of that run die uh, prematurely. If we just go up five more degrees Celsius, we see nearly over 50% of our returning uh, adult runs dying prematurely before they're able to contribute to that next generation. That's a, that's a pretty large proportion, and it's pretty sad when you consider what these fish have gone through in order to come back. Talking a little more on um, high temperatures and, and some of the impacts we see, this is, um, these are July uh, temperatures, uh, average daily temperatures at a um, temperature logger site that we have just above Ryan Creek. And if, uh, for those of you that might not be familiar where Ryan Creek is, it's in the upper Umatilla River, uh, just above Fred Gray Bridge or down below uh, Elephant Rock, uh, kind of that area. And what I did is I took a look at our temperature data that we had there from 2008 to 2018. And knowing that 64 degrees uh, Fahrenheit is kind of that lower limit um, where we start to see uh, stress and impacts to spring Chinook, I wanted to look to see how many days in, in the month of July that we saw an average temperature of 64 degrees or higher. And the, the slash line or the dotted line moving up there, that's the trend line. And so that's showing from 2008 to 2018 at this site, we're seeing a general increase in the uh, number of days where that temperature is um, at or above for a whole day. Um, this area in particular is important because we kind of consider this the lower end, that Fred Gray, Ryan Creek area. Uh, in the early summer, we really like to see our spring Chinook get past that point because above that is our cold water refugia or our sanctuary area for spring Chinook within the Umatilla Basin. So going to that same area, I took a look at um, the red distribution within that area for that same time period. And so we have reaches 24, 25, and 26. And these are survey reaches where we go out and perform red observations. And 24 is that lower reach. It would be that Fred Gray up, uh, up a little ways. And then uh, reach 25 would be um, about three and a half miles above Fred Gray Bridge up to Bar M, and then Reach 26 is from Bar M up to the confluence of the North Fork uh, Umatilla River. And what we see over that same time period 
where those uh, average temperatures were increasing, or those days where those average temperatures were 64 degrees or higher, we see a change in the distribution of our reds. Uh, we see that in that lower reach, uh, um, there's a lower percentage of reds um, being observed there and a higher percent in the upper reaches. Uh, when we see those temperatures going up, this is something we would definitely expect to see um, that they're no longer wanting to use that lower reach. It's becoming less suitable, less desirable. And effectively, what we're seeing in this chart is we're seeing a loss of uh, suitable habitat that's becoming marginal habitat, or we could be seeing marginal habitat that's becoming unsuitable. Five minute warning. Thank you. So just to get another visual of that, this is the spawning red distribution for the years 2008 to 2019 within the Umatilla Basin. And a particular note on this image that I'd like you to look at is the lower range of the distribution on the main stem Umatilla. You see the bottom end of that range falls in with Moonshine Creek. And then looking in Meacham Creek, we've got a fairly good distribution all the way up to North Fork Meacham Creek. As we go forward into 2014, I didn't show 2009 through 2013 because we see a similar distribution to this. We see that not much has really changed. We're doing okay. And then we go into 2015. Now in 2015, we see a, a big loss of that distribution, especially that lower range in the Umatilla River. The important thing to note about this two th 2015 image is that this was a drought year. So we would expect conditions to be a little poorer and maybe that distribution to be a little less. But it's also important to note that the conditions in 2015 are the predicted conditions to be the new normal under climate change scenarios. So you can see how much of that uh, spawning distribution we've lost. Going from 2015 through 2018, there were similar, similar distributions. And then here's our 2019 data, and we still see that loss of that lower distribution. After 2014, we no longer recorded any reds in that lower distribution. Um, and we did have good returns of fish numbers through those years, so we did have the fish to disperse out there. It just doesn't seem like we're uh, seeing suitable habitat down there. We're seeing higher temperatures. Um, in Meacham Creek, we can see that we've got a cluster of reds right there above Line Creek, and it's actually pretty cool if you know what that cluster is. And what that cluster is, is that's, that's our habitat restoration area within Meacham Creek, the same habitat restoration um, area that uh, Gary was talking about in his presentation. And you can see that we've got no distribution really outside of that area, but what we've been able to create is a cold water refugia within Meacham Creek through our habitat restoration efforts, and it is being used. So Gary talked about, uh, we right there in those previous examples, we were kind of seeing how impacts from loss of habitat um, can affect us. Uh, Gary was talking about restoring habitat and he showed some of our projects. And this is gonna be used to kind of illustrate um, why that's important. So uh, this is a stock recruitment um, chart uh, for Umatilla Basin summer steelhead. The X axis at the, at the bottom is uh, the, uh, returning a number of adults for, for a certain year, and the y-axis is showing the progeny or offspring that return in following years um, from those adults. What we tend to see in the Umatilla Basin is that our habitat's limiting us to about 2,000 to 3,000 adult returns before we don't see any benefit in the returning progeny after this. Now, of course, in, uh, like most biological systems, we see a lot of variance in that. There's a lot of variability in that, and that's why we see these dots all over. But you can see how that curve kind of peaks out and then starts to drop off. Um, what that's telling us is that habitat's limiting our production. Uh, this could be either spawning or rearing habitat. But uh, looking at this relationship, it appears that our rearing habitat is limiting us more than our spawning habitat. We can get a large run of adults and and they can go out and spawn throughout, but we just don't have enough area to support those rearing juveniles. Uh, if we want larger and more sustainable runs, we're going to need to uh, increase our rearing habitat to support more juvenile survival. So um, restoration efforts are currently going on that's helping us to increase the suitable habitat and increase the amount of rearing and spawning habitat that we have. But uh, how do we expand the distribution of uh, aquatic first foods without um, big restoration efforts? 
Um, a good thing we can do is we can reintroduce um, first foods uh, into suitable habitats that already exist that are no longer being used. And so in an effort to do that, the fisheries program performed multiple assessment reports for different drainages um, and other sub-basins within the mid-Columbia where habitat like that exists. Uh, since we're in the Umatilla Basin, uh, I'd like to talk a little about uh, the Mackay Creek drainage. So this is an image of the Mackay Creek drainage. It's encompassed in the blue area. You can see the Umatilla River at the top of the screen. Uh, the purple denotes historical use. Now, the importance of the Mackay Creek drainage is that there was a historical um, presence and fishery for anadromous first food, salmon and steelhead. And because there was a lack of um, passage issues, there's no reason to think that we didn't have Pacific lamprey, bull trout, mussels, and uh, other types of aquatic first foods in there. Another important uh, reason to look at Mackay Creek Basin is that for the area, the Umatilla Basin area, it encompasses roughly 23% of the red band rainbow trout. Red band rainbow and summer steelhead are synonymous. Um, they're the same thing within the Umatilla Basin. Currently, this is 23% of the suitable habitat within the Umatilla Basin that's not being used for anadromous steelhead. Mackay Creek is an opportunity to increase rearing and spawn, uh, spawning habitat for multiple first foods. The restoration of anadromous runs of salmon and steelhead can increase harvest opportunities, and it's also going to benefit the resident fishery. Currently, there is only a resident fishery in Mackay Creek, and if something were to happen within Mackay Creek that um, severely impacted that uh, resident fishery, it could be likely that uh, it, it wouldn't have a source to return. So reestablishing anadromy to that stream allows to buffer against those kinds of catastrophic events. Also having uh, anadromy, anadromous returns into something like Mackay Creek buffers and helps mitigate against catastrophic events or poor conditions with other, uh, within other drainages of the Umatilla Basin. It's also important to note that the North Fork Mackay Creek pop property uh, was just purchased by uh, the CTYR and it's an opportunity for us to start doing some restoration within that, um, that drainage itself. So I talked about a little bit about resident fisheries in Mackay Creek, and I just wanted to talk again um, why those resident fisheries may become more important as uh, we move into these climate change scenarios. Oops. So um, initial spatial distribution and rearing habitat availability also increases the opportunity for resident fisheries. Road known treatments in the Umatilla were performed in 1967 and 1974 and severely reduced the resident fishery. Um, as an example of that, it wasn't uncommon before those rote known treatments to catch 18 to 20 inch whitefish, mountain whitefish. Uh, now we're lucky to see mountain whitefish in that range. Uh, mount, uh, mountain whitefish are our first food. And um, now if you catch one in that size, you have the difficult decision to make on whether you would like to harvest that fish or, or return it because you know that's a breeding size adult. Um, so you're, you're limiting your harvest opportunities by not having the quantity there. Uh, making sure that um, the spiritual, cultural, and health benefits of uh, that aquatic first foods provide can be partially maintained through the access to resident fisheries. And they may become more important in the future as anadromous runs continue to fluctuate. Those low run years of anadromous returns can, can at least be a little bit buffered by, by good resident fisheries. So uh, moving forward, what's that? One minute, sorry. Thank you. So moving forward, uh, mitigating climate change, what are some things we can do? Uh, restoration to increase suitable habitat and stop, stop the loss of marginal habitat. We can increase the spatial distribution into available suitable habitat. We should start looking at things uh, like evaluating overwinter conditions for re rearing juvenile salmonids. We often get stuck in this mindset of high summer water temperatures, high temperatures when we think of climate change. But it's important to note that those low flows during late winter and cold temperatures can adversely affect the survival of rearing juvenile salmonids. Uh, when the temperatures get too cold, uh, we can see our juvenile salmonids actually starve to death with full bellies because their digestive systems are temperature driven. Um, we also need to increase our resident aquatic first food harvest opportunities. 
And then we can also look at um, uh, different ideas such as carcass outplanting. We can take those carcasses that um, come from our uh, spawning at hatchery fil facilities and outplant them into habitats where we might not be able to increase the amount of habitat, but we can try to increase the quality and suitability of that habitat. And then we should also take a look at investigating low, uh, known zones of low survival to try to see what the limiting factors are on those and increase the, uh, the survival in those zones within our basins. So real quick, um, just to end, this is a short video from that uh, restoration site up on Meacham Creek. And these are all resident rainbow, red band rainbows. Now that's not to say some of these might choose to out migrate to the ocean, but this is one small pool within that restoration zone. And you can, if you were to count real quickly, you'd see over 20 resident rainbows or red band rainbows in here. So it's really neat to see those actions um, actually come to fruition. And this is just some of the literature um, used for this presentation. Um, Katiaya, thank you, and I hope that I provided something helpful. Thank you, Jeremiah. That was amazing. Um, while we uh, have you, thank you for stop sharing. Um, salmon are very important, but we also have other very important uh, fish species that occupy our wonderful Umatilla River. So, Aaron, please take it away and tell us about the lamprey. Yeah, everybody, hear me okay. Yes, we hear you and see your slides. Okay, great, thanks. My name is Aaron Jackson. I currently serve as the uh, project leader for the for the Pacific Lamprey Research and Restoration Project. This project has been around for a little while. It started in 1994. It's funded by Bonneville Power Administration and the U.S. Bureau of Reclamation. I'll make my next slide go here. So I'd be a little remiss if I didn't introduce the lamprey team. All these guys are very dedicated to our first foods, to um, our natural resources. They, they love lamprey. They enjoy working with lamprey. These guys are all experts in their fields. Um, really appreciate the efforts that they put forward for, uh, for our first foods. The study area for this project has primarily been focused in the Umatilla Basin, but um, we also have, you know, uh, projects going on in other seeded lands within the Toucan and the Walla Walla, Grand Ron, uh, John Day and Imnaha. And I, I also mentioned the, the burnt malheur and powder systems and the Willow Creek system as well, but uh, we have yet to move into those basins. Um, but primarily the focus so far has been in the Umatilla River, and we have started some translocation in the Grand Ron subbasin. But today I'll, I'll probably really focus on the Umatilla River. So first, some Pacific lamprey evolution. Um, you know, lampreys are, are really old. They've been around a long, long time. They are <clears throat> the oldest uh, uh, species about out there right now, back about 450 million years. Some literature even states that they're back to 530 million years ago. To put that into context, dinosaurs came and went from about 240 to 60 million years ago. The current modern salmon evolved about 6 million years ago, and us as humans about 100,000 years ago. <clears throat> There's 43 species worldwide of, of lampreys. Um, five are now extinct. Three species are in the Columbia River Basin. We have the Western Brook, which is a modern anadromous lamprey. That means it does not go to the ocean and back. It stays in the river systems its entire life history. We have a river lamprey that is found down in the more the middle of the Columbia River and the lower Columbia River. It is an anadromous species. And then we have Pacific lamprey. Um, all three of these species exist within our seeded areas. I'll talk about the life cycle starting at six o'clock on the figure. Um, after lamprey um, hatch, they spend, you know, four to six years in this larval phase feeding on detritus so they live down in the uh, sand matter of fact the word amicete is a latin word for for those that live among sand and so um, it makes sense at this life stage they're called amicetes we are though have seen some new data that states that uh, lamprey can spend up to 13 years in the sedentary stage which is quite amazing before moving out um, in, into um, the uh, emerging from the stream and headed to the ocean and so after that uh, time phase in the uh, stream sediment, they go through a metamorphosis where they develop eyes and a mouth to prepare for uh, moving out into the ocean environment. And that usually happens in the fall, late fall to the early spring on high, high flow events. 
They move out into the ocean where they enter this parasitic phase and lamprey feed on a variety of species, primarily ground fish, um, but they're known to be on salmon and um, even whales to feed as well. Um, then they come back into the freshwater systems in a spring where they typically overwinter and spawn the following spring and their carcasses as carcasses they die and uh, they provide those marine derived nutrients that other organisms tend to live off of. Um, CTR's lamprey project goals really is to restore natural production of Pacific lamprey in the Umatilla, Grand Ronde, Toucanon, and Walla Walla rivers to self-sustaining and harvestable levels and also to evaluate the success of that restoration to inform management and for potential application elsewhere. Our project goals within the Umatilla Basin are to monitor success of adult migration, spawning, and also juvenile rearing and out migration, but also to continue to identify those limiting factors and to seek remedies for those limiting factors. Within the seeded area subbasins, um, we're just moving out into those areas. We're starting to conduct juvenile abundance surveys, monitor adult passage trends at the Columbia River and Snake River dams. And we did initiate adult translocation in the Grand Ronde Basin in 2015. Other objectives within the lamprey project are lamprey passage. We're looking at and have installed four lamprey passage structures in the Umatilla Basin. We're monitoring adult passage success over these low elevation diversions Gary and talked about earlier. We're developing and applying pit tagging technology in the Umatilla and Columbia River Basin for the juvenile phase. And we're conducting new research in juvenile tagging, genetics, and eDNA. Additionally, we have um, spent a number of years working in artificial propagation um, to initiate lamprey holding, spawning, incubation, and rearing experiments in the lab environment. That's over at the Walla Walla Community College, uh, what we call the WEC Lab, the Water Environmental Center. And with the ultimate goal there is to successfully propagate two juvenile products, a real early life stage pro larvae and an amicete for eventual release in the Toucan and Walla Walla. And we're really hoping to get the, the first pro larvae out in the Toucan River in just a few months. The Umatilla River though is really our first pilot program. It was a before and after translocation study in the Umatilla River and translocation, all that really means is collecting fish from one location, location and moving them to another location. And so our case study sampling began in 98, followed by adult translocation in 2000. And the key question we asked was, can these translocated fish increase natural production and restore self-sustaining and harvestable levels of lamprey? So to do that, we have to go down and collect brood from the main stem dams. Um, adults are collected from Bonneville, the Dalles, and John Day dams from May through September. Um, adults are held at the South Fork Walla Walla facility and then in the fall we move them to Minthorn Springs until they mature. And that first translocation occurred in the Umatilla River in 2000. And on the left you can see the traps that we developed. You know, uh, the one thing the Corps of Engineers will not let us fish these traps inside areas where salmon are. And so uh, lamprey like to squeeze just about anywhere they can at, a, at, a, at one of the dams. And a lot of the gratings have one inch wide gaps and lamprey can tend to get behind those areas. And so we were designed these special funnel traps, we call them to actually um, pull the lamprey out of there. We're rescuing them because it, they're dead ends for lamprey anyways. And that's also providing the fish for our, for our brood. So we have some findings from that work, from the translocation work. Um, one thing is that adults are relatively easy to hold and to sexual maturity. We see a very low holding mortality, less than 1% a year. And um, I know that other species struggle with that because of high temperatures. Lampreys seem to do fairly well in a, in a warming climate. Um, we release up to about 280 adults annually. That's varied from years where we've only had as few as 68 fish to as many as 600. But recently that's been less and I'll get into that a little bit later. Um, the outplanting occurs in April through June. Um, and then adults are primarily released in the Umatilla River and Meacham Creek and Esculpa Creek. We have moved some into Wild Horse recently um, and just starting to spread those fish out a little bit within the, within the basin. Uh, some additional findings of the red surveys. We found that uh, translocated lamprey successfully built nests. 
We're seeing reds um, all the way through the areas that are close to our release locations. Spawning occurs in May through July, and we found that they don't spawn real close to the release locations, which I said. Um, there's other hot spots, you know, for lamprey spawning tend to be Bear Creek, which is in the upper uh, Umatilla River, Camp Creek, which is about uh, oh, 15 miles or so up the Meacham Creek, and then also down around Thorn Hollow. And Thorn Hollow is really interesting because uh, before we did translocation, and when there used to be lamprey here in the, you know, 1940s, 50s, um, tribal elders talked about going to Thorn Hollow to harvest lamprey, and so um, it makes sense that um, there's some habitat there for them to spawn. But, um, you know, with a potential uh, climate change impact would be, you know, if we do see some increasing surface temps, you know, water temperature wise, we're potentially going to see reduced spawning habitat, which means less production in the lamprey, and also uh, a potential for re of that reduced first food availability. Regarding larval surveys, um, we go out as part of the monitoring here in the basin as we we, we um, look for the larval lamprey. <clears throat> um, egg viability was relatively high initially. Um, we can see that lamprey just dis distributed themselves from the headwaters and moved downstream through time. And we've seen an increase in, in time of the individuals per square meter. Um, we've also noticed, noticed that um, lamprey seem to uh, handle these higher water temperatures. You know, we've surveyed in, in areas where water temperatures are approaching 80 degrees or right at 80 degrees Fahrenheit, and we're seeing lamprey thriving in those conditions. And so uh, may all may not be lost for a, a warming climate in the world of lamprey. It may actually uh, contribute to faster growth for them. However, if we do get those higher winter flows, as Jeremiah was talking about earlier, we would see this displacement of larvae and the larvae would be moving instead of continue rearing in the uh, tributary environment, be pushed out in the main stem environment where they have a chance to be uh, preyed upon more. And, and this can be a real issue because lamprey have such a long freshwater life history. I was mentioning earlier that, you know, their lamprey can spend up to potentially 13 years as an amicete before even moving out into the ocean environment. And so that could have a real large impact. Um, the diagram on the left, you can see, uh, was our work prior to translocation. We went out and surveyed. That's Andrew Wildbill and Donna Nez. Donna, you're going to hear from next here. Back in the day, she was one of our, our lamprey techs. And you can see that um, we didn't have many lamprey. Uh, the mission area starts around site 17 on this, on this diagram on the left. Years later, after doing translocation, boom, we have lamprey everywhere. And as you can see, most of the lamprey are on our reservation. So it's important that we continue to protect those. Five minute warning. Also, um, with the out migration, we're seeing, you know, these trends of uh, lamprey that are moving up in the uh, uh, and, and moving out um, within the Umatilla River. Trapping occurs from no no to May to November or November to May, excuse me. And we're seeing an increase from time of, you know, 3,500 individuals up to over 850,000, but not in all years. Out migration timing correlates directly to large, large hydrologic events. And you can see um, the inset diagram kind of shows um, discharge in the dashed gray line and the black solid line is when lamprey are moving out. And so with that though, with we have a change in climate, increased temps may favor invasive species and also increased predation on on lamprey. In regards of adult immigrants, now these are adult lamprey that are coming back into the Umatilla River on their own. Adult numbers have shown this increased trend. You can see on the inset diagram with the red bars, that's the number of lamprey we've been getting back each year. We have a high R squared value that shows that the trend is increasing. But uh, most of the lamprey use the lamprey passive structures that we build at Three Mile Dam. But to put this into context, just in 2010 alone, we only had six lamprey coming back into the Umatilla River. In 2018, we had 4,703, which is huge. And because of that, the, the Umatilla River is starting to become a more natural self-sustaining population. So we haven't had to rely as much on translocation these last few years. But if we see increased temps, that could lead to poor migration and poor spawning. You know, we'll have less water, less opportunity for these lamprey to move up upstream and spawn and do their thing. This is a, a graph on adult timing. 
Uh, the solid line is um, discharge in the Umatilla River. I took the years 2010 through 2018 and averaged them, and sh and this is what it came out showing. But we have two groups of lamprey that move into the Umatilla River. We have these spawning phase guys, and these are guys that are going to spawn that very year when they enter the Umatilla River. They come in in April and May. And then we also have a migratory phase, which are fish that have entered the Columbia River on a spring and have moved all the way into the tributary environment to overwinter in the tributary environment. If we see a shift in lamprey entrance timing or earlier low flows, that could be detrimental to lamprey up migration. So something to definitely consider. We had adult passage issues. Gary talked about diversion dams. Um, they're also problematic for, for lamprey, not just these big main stem dams, but even these small diversion dams are problematic. We use telemetry to determine locations and, and severity of passage issues and also to prioritize where we were going to do our work. We radio tagged a number of fish from 05 through 08, and passage success was really dire uh, directly correlated to flow, temperature, dam design, and fish size. So if you didn't have a lot of flow, lamprey didn't pass. If you had high temperatures, lamprey held and they wouldn't pass. If you had a dam design, like a dam with an overhanging lip, lamprey had a hard time passing. And if you had a small fish, they also had a hard time passing those areas. But we've done some improvements. Um, we've installed these lamprey passage structures at Three Mile, Feed, and Maxwell, and Dillon diversions. The one in the picture here is at Three Mile Dam. We did some BPA flow enhancements in the lower four miles of the Umatilla River during their migration period, July 1st, August 15th. And with those two things, the LPSs and the flow enhancement, we've seen an increase from 17% to 60% for passage at Three Mile Dam. A couple other benefits is that Dillon diversion and Brownell diversions have now both been removed in the Umatilla River. Hopefully, some more will be coming soon. There's also juvenile passage needs. Um, we really need to understand juvenile passage and tributaries in the main stem environment. Um, salmonid screening systems do not adequately protect lamprey. You can see that clearly on the right hand side. Those are lamprey impinged on a salmonid screen. Um, investigate tributary and main stem juvenile lamprey passage and we need to seek solutions for safe passage. We're putting a lot of money into these fish here in the Umatilla River and it's not acceptable for them just to migrate downstream and get stuck at one of these irrigation diversions and die. Um, the challenge, however, with that is that lamprey are not ESA listed. Therefore, lamprey passage improvements have to be compatible with currently listed species. And time and time and time again, we come across with these great ideas, but they don't work with already listed species. So it's, it's problematic. We're conducting new research in juvenile tagging. We developed a new juvenile tag with high tag ret retention and high survivorship over the three month study. We implemented that uh, technology and we've tagged over 3000 juvenile lamprey. And during those study years, we saw that 11% of the juvenile lamprey were entrained into feed canal. And the migration rates range from uh, not moving very much, a uh, tenth of a mile to 22.2 kilometers in a day. Three mile dam to John Day dam travel times range from 13 to 131 days. But keep in mind that migration times in, in all species, this is not just lamprey, but all species widely vary depending on physiological constraints, environmental factors, and behavior of those fish. Uh, other new research that we're doing is artificial propagation. We've had some great success with spawning, fertilization, incubation, hatching, and rearing over at the WEC lab. And what we've learned is that larval lamprey are tolerant to low flow, high temperatures, and high dissolved oxygen. This may be a benefit in a, climbing, in a changing climate for lamprey. <clears throat> we've also ran into some challenges of how to move these fish from the facilities out to the field. We're working on refining that. Also modifying the culture environment to better suit lamprey. Uh, we're learning that lamprey may, you know, re rely heavily on probiotics. And maintaining and assessing large numbers of larvae. These guys hatch out at nine millimeters. They're itty bitty when they hatch. They're very difficult to count and to assess how just how many fish you have. But just for context, one female can have up to 200,000 eggs. And so um, with that high egg viability that I showed earlier, you know, it's it's not unlikely that uh, with 200,000 eggs that um, 190,000 of them hatch successfully. One minute. However, one minute. with all that, the number one limiting factor still is passage. We see a 50% loss of adults at each dam and at each reservoir. So if you start with 100,000 lamprey at Bonneville, 
quickly you can count those all of those lamprey on your two hands at lower granite dam which is just just unbelievable to that we're still in those kind of conditions and the juvenile losses may even be more significant and we have studies geared up to uh, to answer these questions starting in 2022 with some funding from the Corps of Engineers and partnerships between the Nez Perce, the Yakima and the Umatilla tribes. But we need more funding to address these concerns. We have identified over $107 million worth of lamprey work that needs to occur as of right now. What's next? We're going to be implementing our lamprey master supplementation plan and that's getting the fish out into the uh, to Cannon and continue to do our adult translocation. We're going to continue to address main stem and tributary passage issues. It's the number one factor and advocate for the additional funding that we need. Continue to identify and seek solutions to address limiting factors in other basins. Um, we're just now starting to touch that as we're moving out into the other seeded areas. We're going to use genetics and eDNA for management applications, which is a, a new evolving technology. Continue to uh, have lamprey outreach and education programs and really the ultimate goal is to establish harvest opportunities in the Umatilla River and eventually other basins. We had our first ceremonial harvest of lamprey in 2018 and then we had our first uh, regular harvest of lamprey in 2019 in the Umatilla River. Um, also the, um, we I'm proud to say that we have provided the fish for the new display at the Oregon Zoo in the Great Northwest exhibit. If you haven't had a chance, they really dedicated a huge area to lamprey down there. So if you get a chance with your family, go check it out. Thank you very much. Thank you, Aaron. That was incredible information. Uh, I love uh, everything that you had to share. I always learn something new when I hear all of your guys' presentations. And so I want to, again, pass it on. You had talked about Donna Nez, and um, we're very fortunate to have her on today to tell us about freshwater mussels. So Donna, if you're able, I'd love to have you share your screen and take it away. So you're on mute still if you're talking and I unfortunately don't have the ability to unmute you, which is actually probably a good thing. Um, I'd love to, if you're experiencing any kind of issue, uh, again, the share tray is right next to the leave button uh, and it should have an arrow going up into like a, a rectangle. Uh, and hopefully that will get us to where we need to go. Um, so Donna, if you're able to hear me, um, I would happily provide technical assistance. I know you're in the next room, so I might actually uh, ask if we could um, have uh, the chair of the Fish and Wildlife Commission, Jeremy Wolf, if you want to just tell us a little bit about uh, the role that Fish and Wildlife Commission plays while I go and check with Donna. Okay, I'll cut. Uh, um. So, Jeremy, um, I don't know if you want to kind of tell us a little bit about the role of fish and wildlife in regulating uh, harvest opportunities for tribal members. He might have stepped away. Um, so, we're having some technical issues, and I really appreciate uh, you bearing with us on this and so I'm hoping I can have oh so we had a question so why don't I uh, ask that question uh, in the chat box which is having trouble loading uh, and oh. hello yes hello hey sorry about that I've no, been listening this whole time I just I'm uh, I'm up here helping with the uh, the salmon distribution so that's amazing what a great uh, context for our discussion <laughs> yeah. So, um, step into the next room and help Donna and try and figure out some of the technical issues. So I'd love if you would talk a little bit about the role of Fish and Wildlife Commission and maybe those fish distributions. Uh, sure, sure, sure. Yeah, this is uh, one of the roles. So the commission, <clears throat> it's been a very unique year um, because of the COVID, obviously. And, um, you know, just generally our, our Fish and Wildlife Commission uh, um, identifies uh, a regulatory role for the tribe. Um, we have a number of um, members. We 
Bud, who's on, on the call right now, Bud Herrera. Um, uh, we have Jim, Jim Marsh, uh, who's our secretary. Uh, we have Ken Hall, who is our, uh, our vice chair <clears throat> and the, the latest uh, or the newest uh, elected um, member is uh, uh, Brandon Trelore. And um, uh, Chelsea, Chelsea Dick is our staff secretary. Um, we have a number of roles <laughs> that we have to take on, number of hats that we have to put on. Uh, one of the most notable ones is, is traveling down to Portland. Obviously, travel isn't occurring now, so most of our, if not all of our correspondence is through video conferencing, just like today. Uh, but with uh, CritFic, we have a, uh, a monthly meeting. Well, within CritFic, there's a number of uh, sub-delegations that we have. Uh, speaking to a lot of the management that's been talking today, we talk Lamprey, we talk M and E, we talk a, a lot of these issues. Um, and, and one of the one of the great things that we're we're pushing now um, is the uh, uh, oceanic uh, observation and and uh, and hopefully some more monitoring, and that'll be hopefully pushed forward through uh, a lot of the work that's going on down at Crific. Uh We've recently um, uh, taken over. Um, um, a, uh, it's called CMOP, uh, Coastal Monitoring. I can't remember the acronym right off the top of my head right now. It's an observation uh, um, uh, facility down on the in the estuary of the Columbia River. Um, so that's uh, that's exciting to um, have us uh, be at the at the doorstep of the uh, Columbia River there, <clears throat> and um, where all of our fish come back into and go out there out to the ocean. So that area right there is a is a highly volatile area for our fish. Um, and so we're doing all we can in that area. Recently had a, a, sea, a sea lion bill um, uh, adopted in, in the U.S. legislature uh, for our, allowing us to start uh, okay. um, lethally taking okay, that's unmuting. Our, our salmon or lethally taking uh, sea lions uh, in protections of our salmon. Some of the recent studies that we've had down there, recent uh, Alec, um assessments uh, is that they're taking upward to 40 40 uh, 40 45 percent of our salmon uh, runs uh, different runs um, at the highest up uh, below bon below Bonneville there so I think that's going to be a big deal um, have had uh, some recent talks um, on the uh, <coughs> uh, cormorants uh, which is a, a num uh, one of the major bird species that takes a lot of our mount migrants uh, not only a cell mounted uh, salmon but and steelhead but uh, lamprey so that's something i think that is uh, going to be also important and, and mind you these uh, sea lions and these birds um, are protected species and so it kind of we're kind of pitted against uh, having esa species pitted against one another and, and that's always a difficult task and, and, and a management uh, scheme we have to be aware of and and trying to find that balance. And so when we talk about that uh, that balance that uh, our ancestors uh, were were working with years ago um, when we started the invocation and, and and throughout the discussions that we've had uh, in the more recent history, uh, that, that's uh, that's really our goal is, is trying to find that balance. And right now they're sea lions and cormorants and, and, and other animals like that are taking advantage of a, of a human-made situation. And, and of course, um, uh, temperature and, and uh, cold, uh, uh, climate change certainly plays a role in that as well. Okay. So, so, you know, moving up the tributary, just wanted to get to the point I was going to make with this distribution. You know, we're, we're not um, having our, our ceremonies um, as, we, as we normally would. So we have a number of fish um, and right now we're, we're distributing some of those fish to um, um, those in need. Um, and, and so if there are any, uh, the, the line's still big. So any tribal members on the call right now, um, you, st you certainly can uh, come up here and we're trying to get some, some fish to those in need. Uh, but uh, but that's, that's just part of the role. Okay. Normally these fish are, are designed for ceremonial use and subsistence, but, um, but this is a, a certainly a, a justified use. And, and like you said before, uh, um, Colleen, I, I could go on and on, <laughs> but uh, um, I, I just I think that's probably a, a decent introduction. Um, but uh, but yeah, we're we're working with all the staff who are presenting here. They they report to the Fish and Wildlife Commission. Um, uh, some of this data has been reported, but uh, um, it's always great to to hear all the work being great work being done. Um, much of the the system. 
uh, is is way behind, uh, and we need to make sure that we're we're uh, creating regulations that are that are respective of that, um, and then uh, and then suggesting policy changes where needed to the board of trustees. And maybe the last thing I wanted to say is that uh, our meetings are open to all of our tribal members. So, so uh, if you guys uh, want to reach out to myself or any of the the commissioners or or through staff through through uh, Chelsea Dick. Um, Definitely uh, look forward to that uh, input, and uh, you know, my number is is available as well. So uh, we can provide you that information if you need it today, or or you can always uh, just call into the to the governance center to to get get a hold of me or any number of our membership. But um, uh, you're free to join the meetings or or call with any of your input. And, uh, that's always greatly appreciated. Jeremy, thank you. That was amazing. I think we figured out the uh, technical issues. So we're going to have Donna um, present. Donna, I'm going to let you know that we can see your screen. OK. And, and I apologize I about the technical difficulties here. So Donna, we can see you just fine. And Jeremy, thank you so much. Did you have a final thought that you wanted to conclude with? Because um, I really appreciate you kind of filling that space. <laughs> yeah, no, no, no worries. Um, yeah, the only thing is that, that I, I appreciate Donna and, and their work with the freshwater mussels. It's, it seems to be always a forgotten um, thing that we have. You know, we give so much attention to our uh, our uh, our salmonids and, and and even lamprey are getting more attention so uh rightfully so um but these are our cleaners of our, our river uh, of food as well um and, and i still owe her a uh a life cycle uh, i told her that i would be doing a life cycle for their project and uh, just been kind of a stop and go on it so i apologize about that donna I'd, uh, but i will get that uh, completed as soon as i can can you hear me yes uh, we don't see your okay. screen. Okay. All right. Um, so my name is Donna Nez, and I am with the Freshwater Mussel Project. And today I'm going to be talking about freshwater mussels and climate change. Can you hear me? Sorry. You can keep talking. It's not. OK, here it is. OK, can you guys see my screen now? Yes. Hello? Yes. OK. Yes. Yeah. All right, so I'm just going to start. Um, the freshwater mussel outline today I'm going to be talking about. I'm going to start with the background on mussels and then the down factors of mussel habitat species in CTY waters, life cycle and fish relationships, wall wall propagation lab, implementing river vision and how climate change affects muscle community. Um, so in the DNR mission statement, um, just to protect, restore and enhance the first foods, water, salmon, deer and huckleberry for perpetual cultural, economic and sovereign benefit of the CTYR. Um, so the goal of the research is to provide information on the status, distribution, and controls of freshwater mussels. The overall objective is to design a recovery plan for mussels in the Umatilla River and other Mid-Columbia River watersheds where mussels may be declining or extinct. So um, starting off, freshwater mussels are relatively stationary. Once they um, are in a certain part of the river, they don't really move if they have suitable habitat and water quality. Um, freshwater mussels, they spend most of their entire life partially are fully buried in mud, sand, or gravel in permanent water. Most species of mussels are found in streams. Some species can be found in ponds or lakes. Um, Muscles stay in place by, by their foot. Uh, they can hunker down in the substrate. Uh, it holds them.
Donna, we lost your sound. Can you hear us, Donna? Winter resting periods, kind of like a tree's rings. Okay, just tell me what, like, when you can hear me in there. <clears throat> um, we they have rings like um, a trees, like trees uh, that tell how old they are. Um, they're filter feeders. Uh, fresh waters feed by taking water through an incurrent siphon, which passes over the mucus covered gills where small food items are collected and then transferred to the mouth. Unplatable items and waste particles are flushed out through an excurrent siphon. By filtering out suspended particles, including impurities, muscles improve water quality, improving quality of streams and lakes. And Colleen, can you hear me? Can anybody hear me? Yes, we can hear you. OK. Um, so next, um, freshwater mussels, they are able to filter 10 gallons of water per day. Um, they also clean the water in which they live. As filter feeders, they strain large quantities of microscopic materials, such as algae, bacteria, and organic particles out of the water, making them especially sensitive to changes in water quality. And um, just a fun fact, in a reach of a river of 200 yards long, a bed of 100,000 freshwater mussels can filter 30,000 30, gallons of water. Um, Freshwater mussels have the greatest diversity in North America with 297 recognized species and subspecies that make up the most endangered family of animals in the United States. 69 species have already been listed by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife as endangered or threatened. Um, freshwater mussels play an important role in the ecosystem. Mussels are an important food source for many animals, including muskrats, minks, otters, fishes, and some birds. Large piles of clean mussels can be called mittens along riverbanks where muskrats are actively foraging. And they play a cultural and traditional resource um, in historical and today's resources. Yeah. Okay. So um, the down factors of muscle habitat, um, habitat degradation, um, introduction of Asian clams and zebra mussels, pollution, impoundments, um, loss of host fish, overharvesting, commercial dredging, channel gravel or sand mining, channelization, excess sedimentation, poor land, poor land use practices, and water quality changes. So today I'm going to be talking about the three species of mussels found here in the Umatilla homelands. Uh, starting off with Ganita and Gulata western ridged mussel. Um, shells have distinct ridges along the umbo to the posterior valve. Um, it has a smaller absent pseudocardinal tooth. Like I said, they have a strong, Gididia of all mussels has the strongest anchor for their foot that holds them in the water. They kind of uh, anchor in between boulders to hunker down during high flow events. Uh, they prefer runs and riffles in mid to low gradient streams. Uh, they, their larvae can be found on fish between June and mid July and their host fish utilize sculpin. Next, we have Margaritifer falcata, which is the western pearl shell mussel. And their shells can be thick with lateral and pseudocardinal teeth. So they, out of three mussels, they have one tooth that holds their, their shells together. And they are found in faster, cooler water and varying gradient streams. 
They occur in high to mid and low elevations, and their larvae can be found on fish, on gills, between April and late May. And they utilize uh, rainbow trout for their host. Next, we have uh, Anodonta floaters species. Uh, their shells are very thin and smooth, and they don't have no teeth. Uh, they are very difficult to identify to species level and they prefer, prefer the low to mid gradient streams and stable backwaters. So they're able to withstand um, slower moving streams such as Wild Horse Creek. They prefer that habitat up there. Um, their larvae can be found on fins between early and late June, July. And they're, they're not as host specific as Ganidia or um, Margatifera. So theirs ranges from dace, shiners, sculpins, sticklebacks, and some salmon species. So next we're going to move on to the cultural aspects of freshwater mussels. Uh, mussels, they're an important food source historically. Uh, their shells were used for domestic jewels and jewelry. Uh, Native Americans in the Pacific Northwest use mussels for their protein rich meat. Uh, not all Pacific Northwest tribes used mussels in their diet. Uh, mussels were often collected during salmon fishing or when conditions were favorable. Uh, they mostly were eaten during the winter time when other things were scarce. And uh, use has declined in, in recent years, but they still remain a reserved tree right to this day. And we have some examples of um, historical collection of shells that we have from the Umatilla town site. And uh, on the right, there's a, just like an example of a button that um, an individual whittled out for jewelry. Also, the second one in the middle, those are like little bead, bead cl clam disc beads. And then just an example of like um, a mitten that was in the area. So next we're gonna move on to the life cycle and this was illustrated by Jeremy. So um, the female freshwater mussel, she carries her eggs inside her shell. Um, they're called gills. The male releases sperm into the water. The sperm enter the, fe the female by the incurrent siphon where the eggs are fertilized internally. And um, next fertilization of freshwater mussels takes place within the blood chambers of the female as means of obtaining oxygen, the eggs are soon developed into what is called clachidia. And then the, the clachidia will attach to the fins or if it's smargative or agnidia, the gills. And then the female then keeps her fertilized eggs in her, in her gills and then they will become a parasitic stage called clachidia. Glaucidia are about as small as a grain of sand at this stage, and they need to come in contact with a, a specific fish host. So if they don't become in contact with that with their host, they um, awfully slough off the fish and die. Um, successful attachment usually lasts from one to 25 weeks, depending on the host location and water temperature. After a few weeks, Glaucidia, they undergo cocoon stage, much like a moth, which is called a cyst. And at the last stage, Glaucidia metamorphose into a juvenile freshwater mussel and drop off to the substrate. The time required for Glaucidia metamorphosis varies with temperature and among mussel species. Uh, next, we're going to get into the propagation lab. Um, it's a collaborative effort between the community college and the tribe. And their primary focus is on mussels and lamprey. And um, research is an early, early life rearing requirements and identifying barriers to survivorship in the wild. So the propagation goals are to develop and propagate Margatifera falcata, Ganidia, and Anodonta. And we want to outpla outplant those propagated adults, and so we can enhance and restore enhanced restoration efforts and uh, a little more of that will be in our master muscle sublimation plan finalized in 2021. Um, 
propagated mussels, they determine suitable habitat in the future. So as results, um, traditional methods for Western mussel species have not been successful. So we are developing a new, a new rearing system using pulse delivery of food and water and it has been successful for Anodonta and Margotifera. The tribe has partnered with USGS in Missouri to develop the technology and use to, to produce mussels needed for outplanting and restoration work. And for the future, we want to continue testing newly developed propagation methods and long-term rearing to eventually fulfill supplementation plan goals and objectives. So um, I know Gary has, he touched on the river vision. So I am just going to, I kind of want to tie in um, the river vision and like what Eric has done in his beginning phases of the river vision. So the goal is to restore floodplain and incre increase forest foods for tribal member use. So um, we have the Riverstone River Vision Touchstones and the aquatic biota. Um, Mussels are, are an important part of the river ecosystem. They are frequently underestimated, rep, underrepresentative or undervalued as members of a river community, especially during restoration activities. The River Vision highlights the, the role that each member plays in the community. Mumble, mussels provide important ecological services for fish and vertebrates on the river, such as nutrient cycling and substrate stabilization. With, without them, a river community is lacking certain services and other organi organisms may be hindered. Um, in the touchstones, um, mussels are part of the mussel aquatic biota, and they are affected and can influence other touchstones through the relationship to the river environment, including mussels in pre-restoration work and during construction. They can help and protect and preserve existing populations and find areas for um, mussel restoration um, by outplanting and monitoring. Um, so for the river vision, we have long-term monitoring sites up in the Umatilla. Um, we also have them in the John Day and the Toucan, basis, and Toucan Basins, and they have both shown decreasing and stable populations. Um, our monitoring in the Umatilla River um, has shown that previous restoration efforts, translocating mussels in mid-2000s, was not successful. This was likely due to habitat or host fish issues in the area. And these sites have given us more information about mussel survival and population dynamics, so we can choose sites for, for future restoration that are likely will be more successful. Okay, so um, I just kind of wanted to use this older um, table that was drawn up by Eric um, years ago. So I wanted to show the floodplain ecology, eco, ecology, ecology underwater and salmon, and it has the in-stream riparian floodplain hyperreic. And um, Eric, he uh, developed this He's extending the table, like Gary said, and in this table, it encompasses like all of DNR. And um, I wanted to focus on the industry riparian and the floodplain hyperreic today. So um, in this next, it shows that mussels are under the salmon category of extending the table. And so he has like came up with the concept of like a serving order and like all of these, these foods are under these like these different sections and they're all put out into, into the longhouse in a serving order. And he has them all in the same order on his table. And so, um, and mussels are part of that under salmon. So um, I just like wanted to kind of like give you guys an example of how how Eric has organized this and um, from the beginning in our longhouse order and um, it's 
been established for centuries. And I think it's a very good way of model that um, explains and um, documents this. So lastly, um, I just want to talk about freshwater mussels and climate change. Um, starting with shell, shell degradation of shells. Um, historically, we have seen that shells were a lot more thicker historically from the collection that we work with up until mustelic. Um, versus today, the shells are like very like weak and thin, brittle, actually. Um, and we concluded that our made a guesstimation that it's from the calcium deposits in the river. They're not as strong anymore as they once were. Uh, secondly, uh, weather patterns altering muscle reproduction. Um, we've noticed that during reproduction times early in the years that um, historically they used to like warm up, you know, degrees and like instead like we come to find out that instead of like warming up, like the temperature will bounce around, it'll like warm up and it'll like cool off like two or three degrees and then like warm up a degree. And so this is altering the muscle reproduction patterns that we have. And so it's, it's kind of, it's kind of tricky because it's, um, we were kind of guessing like when muscles are going to be reproducing. And so um, next we have loss of muscle beds and we have an example at the top. You can kind of see a healthy muscle bed. And this is, this was one of our Gunidia beds. This is like one of our number one um, strong muscle beds that we've had. And it was located in the middle of Fort John Day. And at the bottom, you can see an example, that's the same muscle bed. And that, that was taken in 2008. And there's been long documents of uh, muscle beds being um, totally taken out. And it's like, um, not just here in the Northwest, but like across the United States. And so uh, obviously we have declining host fish, um, just there's some not, there's not as many fish in some areas like such um, sculpin up in the Umatilla. Um, Rainbow trout are kind of in declining areas and um, severe drought is making muscles more susceptible to diseases. So there's been a lot of um, climate change that changes that affect freshwater mussels. So, so um, I just wanna end my presentation and open it up for some questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Donna, that was amazing. Um, I know it, technical difficulties can be a little bit flustering, and so I'm really thankful um, that you powered through and you gave us this uh, wonderful presentation. I, I feel like I learn so much every time I listen to your presentation. I'm really excited for, excited for the forthcoming uh, master muscle reintroduction plan. That's going to be really, really cool. Uh, and thank you again for bearing with us with technical difficulties. And so that brings us to our uh, final and very important speaker, uh, Bud Herrera. I would love if you are on the line uh, to unmute yourself uh, and say hello. So I'd love for someone to let me know if they're seeing a PowerPoint uh, presentation. Yep. Perfect, thank you. Um, Bud, I wanna again check to see that uh, you are available on the line. Uh, otherwise I might try and give you a call here. I can hear you talking in the other room, and so I think that there might be a connection issue. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen and we're going to give Bud a call. Thank you again for bearing with us. Um, I'm sure everybody here can sympathize with the technology issues that we are experiencing. Uh, I know that this has not been easy for a lot of people who are not technologically savvy, such as myself. And so this has been kind of an extra uh, task for all of us to learn and so we're giving bud a call and hopefully uh he will be able to receive this call on his cell phone hello. oh hello 
Can you hear us? We can hear you, can bud. You hear yes. Okay. Let me get my pictures back up. Absolutely. Okay, there we go. All right, hang on, let yes. me share mine so we can get in sync. So I'm gonna be sharing photos for you because we um, put together this PowerPoint. So uh, let me know, I'm on uh, the photo of your um, fishing shack on the river. Okay, yeah, the, uh, my name is Bud Herrera. I'm on the Fish and Wildlife Commission. Uh, uh, I am a, a fisherman on the river full time. Uh, these are my scaffolds that you're looking at. Uh, let's see, my shelter. A few other tribes are in there in between there. Uh, I'm up in the left corner. You can see me there. I'm a little camoed out by that big rock. Uh, what I wanted to show with this right here in the background, you'll see the water. And this picture of this water is after they shut the spillways. And what it does is turn our, the water there into a lake. And when they do shut the spillways like this, uh, what I'm, we're, we're all seeing is we're seeing more back eddies now, where the water's running up river, kind of like when they first built the dams. When what they said, like the little goose and some of these other dams, are making these uh, back heavy back eddies where the water's running up. Okay, with the next picture, this I wanted to just a little bit show you guys, like uh, the staff does, our harvest biologists. I kind of took this with a. Uh, our five senses, the smell, see, what you see, you feel, you hear. Uh, so I did a, a 10 year, this is 10 years ago. As you can see, the, the fish are a little bigger, well, a lot bigger. You can go to the third screen and show that third screen. This is last year. So you guys can, actually see the difference in the size of the fish of what we've seen in the last year, 10 years on the river. Uh, they're saying it's the ocean conditions and, you know, this is right after, you know, the, the, the blob that we all heard about out there. And, and it's the same time of the year. I kind of did the 10 year with last year or two years ago. You can also notice what I'm wearing. 10 years ago, I was in shorts. Last year we were in Long John. So there is a lot that we're seeing down there. The temperature changes, the water, the upwelling, uh, the, the size of the fish difference, uh, the, the firmness of the fish, you know, there's a lot to it. The, the way the water is, you know, you can actually kind of see it's a little clearer in the bigger fish to the, the lower one, it was a little dirtier. And it's about the same time of the year. So I wanted to do a little comparison with that. Uh, yeah, that's just about that. You can go to the, the next one with the first foods. I wanted to throw this in. It was pandemic times last year. So this was it. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, we did a lot of bartering down there on the bank. Uh, I bartered my canned salmon for the Ritz. And uh, the celery, the biscuit roots, I, I know them as biscuit roots. Uh, they're really good. So I was bordering down there, with, you know, as a, as a fisherman in the pandemic. There was only like three of us compared to, I don't know, 30 in recent years. So that's uh, some of what we do as a fish, fisherman on the river. It's not all about the commercial. Uh, Last year was a lot about filling our own freezers, our friends' freezers, uh, taking care of the families who lost ones that went on a new journey. Uh, yeah, so that's just a little bit of that. You can go to the the next one is my dry shack. Uh, last year, because of the pandemic, uh, I built my own dry shack, which uh, really, Played a significant part in my winter with my friends and the family, and this being one of our ways of bartering, uh, I could trade for gas. Like you know, you know, we didn't get out of this place very much. We all pretty much all of us went into uh, our own quarantine last year, 
so to say. We didn't have too many people on the river. There was two or three of us. We had some, we were all, excuse me, we were all in our same little bubble. But it was a lot colder last year. And that was one of the things we noticed. Uh, we were we were bundled up. We were seeing freezing temperatures in uh, into March, into April, which was really unusual for us. You know, waking up with frost on your windows, and you know, do we really want to fish? And but as fishermen, we have to get in the water. So that was one of the obstacles we did have with the climate. We're seeing that it's get, staying colder later in the fall. I mean, in the spring. And and it's and when it does come on, the heat is it comes on. Uh, we've seen a lot more wind. Uh, I have a picture later on about some wind. Uh, we've seen some waves that were six to eight foot waves. You know, the wind last year there was like three severe windstorms that we had with the climate, and three of us. Our trailers actually, uh, our doors got ripped off our trailers. The suction of the wind was so bad that it, it ripped our trailers doors completely right off the, our hinges. Uh, so we did have to move from this area. There was no protection for our trailers. So uh, yeah, with that, you can go ahead and go to the kids. Where I fish where I'm hooking line and it's right there in Rufus below John Day. This place where we, we fish is about three miles down river from the dam. Uh, we try to get the kids down there. These are some of uh, my friends. Uh, they're, it's their first fish. As you can see on the left, there, there's a lot of guys around. So when these kids are getting their first fish, we're, we're really trying to make sure that they they land it. So yeah, there's uh, the one on the right. He was my friend's uh, grandson. He got his up. I think he was only four or five years old. The one on the left, I'm helping this girl. She was 10 years old. She got her first fish. Uh, then we have our own little ceremonies there. We uh, There wasn't much traveling, so we just did dinners there on, for these kids. Uh, they had their own little giveaways. Uh, just something small. But we were uh, teaching the kids the, you know, how to respect their fish. Okay, the other one is uh, I'm trying to show you guys, you know, my hoops. Those are our hoops that we use. Uh, uh, mine are, that one's about, that's my biggest hoop. It's a 26-footer. Uh, I have a bigger hole. Uh, most of mine aren't that big because our holes, you know, the rocks that we're fishing in, you know, you put a big hoop down there, you're not going to catch fish. They're going to go right in those underneath the hoop, you know. Uh, there you can actually see the webbing. I got a, uh, I think it's a seven and a half. We were, we were uh, running bigger webbing, seven and a half to eight, uh, on our scaffolds there. And why we do that is in our webbing is because of the steelhead. This is a full time here. Uh, we have the the B run running, so we're trying to you know if they can get in there, they'll steelhead you know can usually get through the big eight inch. So we do that. And at the bottom I'm, from my left hand, since I told you about the, the eddies, we're having to, you see that little black line there. That is a, uh, I've got about 10 railroad spikes taped on there. So it holds it down. So the, the water is, is, it's moving this time of the year when they shut those spillways down. Uh, Let's see, you can uh, probably go to the other one. I'm just going through these fast and then I'll circle back on some of them. Uh, this is a, the the geese that we're seeing. And there's our swallows. That's usually an indicator, those swallows on the right. For us fishermen that the, the springers are here. But like I said, lately, this picture I think was late April. You know, we're usually seeing them, you know, 10 years ago, I'll go back 10 years, we're seeing them uh, in March. 10 years ago, I was catching fish in March. Usually on uh, my, my, my calendar was daylight savings time is usually when I, a lot of us would get down there and look into it for our ceremonial fish. 
because uh, they were big and and they're really nice fish. So a lot of us would uh, we would get down there a little earlier and uh, fish and start doing for our ceremonials and start getting some fish dried. Usually, what I do for the first week or two is try and get fish to people that usually don't get it or they have their ceremonials or their naming. It's just been something that I've been doing and I enjoy doing it. Uh, let's see. The next one is the big waves. When I talked about those winds, this was probably a six. By the time it hit the bank, this turned into about a six to seven foot wave. First time in the, geez, the last 12 years that I've been down there that we've seen anything like this. Uh, this was the, probably the day that most of us lost a lot of stuff. You know, the wind was howling through there so hard. Uh, yeah, it upwelled everything. It took out the bank that we fish on. We lost about three foot of the bank last year because of the wind and the big waves. It was, uh, we couldn't fish. Uh, we did not fish. Uh, some of us went up to the scaffolds, but the waves were so big up there that, you know, it was unsafe to be on our scaffold. Um, yeah, the, the runoff really helped. You could see the the brown water up there, and uh, that's about 20 feet where it's at. So it was up well in about 20 feet out. Okay, you can go to the next one with the. Okay, on these I'm looking. You could see the water disappeared on it. This was like, you know, a few years back. I think it was 2015. I wanna. That's why I kind of did this. Uh, we woke up one morning and that's what we saw. Where on the left, where I'm looking back, I'm probably 75 yards out, at least 50 to 70 yards out, looking back. On the right is 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 where we came back out, and within three hours the water was coming back up. So it was kind of different. It was one of the first times we'd seen that. We're seeing it every once in a while, but nothing to this to this extreme because you know that you actually can see what's in the water there was you know there was garbage all along this in this mud there was you know there was a tire someplace out there i think one of our nephews grabbed there was all kinds of you know anchors there was a couple anchors that some guys grabbed uh so when we actually got to see this water going down, that's what a lot of us noticed, some of us older guys, that look at all the trash. So we know that's, that's going on while we're, while we're fishing, when the water is running. So that was just uh, something of some of the extreme. That was really shocking to a lot of us to see this, to wake up, we're catching fish. Next morning, we wake up. We don't fish. It was like this for almost two days. So we, we did not fish for almost two days. Some guys walked way out there, but yeah, it wasn't it wasn't worth it the time. Okay, on the next ones, uh, this I just wanted the the little human contact that we have run into since we've had these more wins. The one on the left was uh, they said it was too dangerous for being in this where we usually park. Uh, so they uh, put a gate up on us. Uh, we went to to our lawyers and stuff, and uh, the next day they had it down. It was a right of access for us, and yeah, it was just something that another that thing, the obstacle that we we faced down there with, you know, with the people and the the core of engineers. Just out of the blue, they decided they're going to put a gate up on us. On the right. There's the winds. These guys are showing up more and more. I know a couple of them. That I know them pretty good. They actually have named, one of the things we've noticed is they're naming our fishing site. They have names on pretty much every spot like this. They have a name for a, a three mile. I guess they have a name up there. Down at Mamalus, they renamed that. Oh, down at Stevenson. They actually put their own non-native names on their website and, and for, you know, the social media, you know, one day if this guy called somebody, 
within three hours, we could have a hundred of them doing that. And what they're doing is they're crossing over our lines. They get in our way. Uh, yeah, it's just a one of the human factors with this, uh, the with the wind now and with these guys coming in. You know, I know it's their recreation, but you know, we're it's ceremonial time for us this time. So last year we had a few confrontations, but it was all settled and with out any blows being thrown because it you know because the way the fishing has been lately in spring you know every fish is counting for families to have for their freezers and their their ceremonies right here this one is just a little picture of of it all the way up and uh the trash that has came up, you see all that on the right. There's a bunch of garbage in there. It's not really, you can't really see it that good, but I didn't know there was a bunch of garbage in there. And those invasive willows, you look up to the left, they, these are the invasive species of this new willow that's growing along there. I'm not the biological term guy, but they're, they're, they're showing up in droves. I can't remember the name, but they're filling up our whole area. And, uh, also with that i think our chairman was down there I, I forgot to get the picture we're seeing that uh flowering rush and this area that you're looking at there usually we can start in in april and we'll fish till june before that the temperatures rise and it grows now it's you know we're we're probably pulling out middle of may because the temperatures rise and that that the invasive species are starting to grow a lot more. Uh, Jeremy Wolf, he was down there, and there was one new one that we seen last year. I didn't get a picture, but Jeremy did, and uh, yeah, I don't know what he did with it, but it was a new, a new invasive species that we're seeing in this scene. It's coming from up river up by a fellow, is what one one fisherman said. Uh, the red, white, and blue. There, that, I fish at night, so I wanted to give you guys a view, my view. And uh, you can see the difference in the water before the spillways are closed. There's the water's actually moving. There's waves. Uh, yeah, this is off of my shelter scaffold. And uh, the last one there is just uh, me. We were. Uh, this is something different for me. I was fishing during the daytime. So the 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 fish are running at different times now. So I threw this in there to show that I'm actually fishing daytime now too, where I usually never fished until night, until until evening. But uh I want to drop back on to the, the, the 2015, you know, the, the horrific sights we've seen down there with this the the water being with the with excuse me the water where i showed you where all the mud was and stuff uh we don't talk about this too much but that was a record year for us on the, the blue bat and one of the things we did see a lot of us seeing was the temperatures of the water i think gary might have the right temperatures at 72 i think it got up to even maybe hotter than that what we seen was when we were pulling our fish out, the fish were coming up with no skin on them. Uh, it was it was an ugly sight. They uh, we'd pull them in and and they looked half cooked, but they were still flopping on the water on the scaffold. So and then they had boils on them. You know they were actually just cooking. So that was just something about the temperatures that we have seen in that year that that bad year of 2015 was. We actually watch these fish just boil up, get cooked, and float down there. Uh, there was, geez, almost, I don't know, hundreds of thousands that went by that year, and we were seeing them belly up, floating down the river, right below the, the, the ladder there. We, you know, they were just piling up, and it was, you know, a lot of us just quit fishing for a, a few days because, you know, it, it didn't feel right, the death that we smelled, the fish. Uh, you see them washed up on the bank. Yeah, so I just wanted to share that of that blob and the effect that it took on us, you know, as fishermen to see that was a kind of a tough sight to see. Uh, 
when we're talking about one of the smells and stuff, one of the senses that, that we have, we're noticing that we're smelling more dead fish. I mean, the banks are, there's the invasive species. I don't, we don't know what it is, but we're seeing more and more and smelling more and more of uh, dead fish. Uh, we're seeing more of the cormorant. Uh, the white birds, the, the big pelicans, the horned pelicans, that 10 years ago, I'd probably see one or two, you know, a little three or four they run in. That's how they run together or fly together. Uh, but now at night, I can see up to at least 100 of them at certain times, like when the shad babies or the shad smokes are running or even our smoke in the springtime. And, uh, and when the eels are running. And uh, you know, with that, you know, talking about the the lamprey, uh, that's you know one 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 of the things we see. I don't hate bouncing around. One of the things we do see with the lamprey on our timing, like the birds, is we start seeing the the hitchhiker marks, is what we call them, the little round circles on the salmon. And actually, this year I talked to our harvest biologist and was asking when are they going to start showing up because we're seeing rings and. Uh, is it next week we started seeing uh, lamprey guys? So it was, uh, you know, kind of like we can see what's happening firsthand by the just the regular mother mother nature just showing us signs that I, I believe that our ancestors seen. So with that, uh, I'll take any questions and with the kids I'd like sure I know we have a lot of tribal kids around here I sure would like to see a few of those down <clears throat> down on the river uh, more than welcome uh, Thanks, with that I'd, that'd be it for me Colleen no I was just gonna say um, thank you so much did you have any kind of final words that you wanted to wrap up with uh, yeah, just that uh, it was a pleasure to do this, and I was a little nervous. Uh, thank the the creator you know, for having this opportunity, and uh, you know, it's a, just a little fisherman science, I guess, is what I've been told. You know, we see a lot that a lot of guys don't see. So yeah, I'll take any questions, and if. Any of you guys, you know, you have my number or anything, I'll be moving down here with, as soon as my shoulder gets ready to fish and we'll start sturgeon fishing next month. And then uh, we'll start salmon fishing and you're more than welcome to come down. That's amazing. Yeah. Thank you. Um, it, it was inspiring to hear. I mean, it was a lot of what you talked about was really upsetting and um, that's to be understood. And I agree that you are really the eyes on the ground. You are this fisherman scientist and it's really important to hear what you are observing. So thank you so much for being willing to share and it was awesome. So thanks for overcoming that nervousness. Um, I know that we are a little bit past time, but I am willing to stay if you all are. And I understand if you do have other pre-scheduled appointments to get to, but I think that now is a valuable time for our uh, discussion period. Uh, and so we did actually have one question uh, in the chat here. So Kate Ely asks, is there competition for habitat space between salmonid reds and lamprey eggs? So I don't know who wants to take that. Yeah, I, this is Aaron. Um, we do see that um, lamprey tend to superimpose on top of steelhead reds. Steelhead come in and spawn, you know, as early as January. And I think, you know, Jeremiah can correct me a little more, but, you know, March and April, they start wrapping up. They might spawn into May, but lamprey also spawn, you know, as early as April and May. And so <clears throat> some of those areas where we've actually witnessed that, Preston Bronson and I, when we both worked on lamprey together, we would see um, lamprey actually go and make a red on top of an older steelhead red. And that may have been just because um, those areas, those gravels were already uh, moved, and so they're easier to dislodge. Um, lamprey actually use, unlike salmon, use their mouths to create their red. So they have that suction disc, and so they'll build a nest, 
And an easy way to determine a uh, steel or distinguish a steelhead red from a lamprey red is that um, lampreys will also turn rocks upstream compared to a salmon that's using its tail to scour out the red. Most of the rocks are turned downstream. Lampreys will actually turn some rocks over upstream of their nest as well. And so <clears throat> habitat, um, you know, back to Kate's question, is there competition between the two? Um, I don't think there's as much competition as as people might think. I think that um, there's a, a relationship there that we're failing to understand between steelhead and lamprey. Um, I'll, I'll second that with Aaron. Uh, we actually enumerate uh, a lot of the the lamprey reds um, during spawning ground surveys for steelhead reds, but we really don't see any direct competition. Um, the selection of the the red sites is somewhat different for for those species. Um, Aaron said, I mean, Aaron's obviously witnessed it where they've been in reds, but I don't think that's a common occurrence from what we're seeing out there in the field. Great, those are excellent answers. Uh, here in the chat, you're getting a lot of uh, congratulations and applause for your excellent presentations. Uh, a lot of wonderful thank yous for all of your presentations, expertise and experience. Uh, and so I wanted to give everyone the opportunity. If you want, uh, we can now turn our videos on and um, now is an opportunity for us to chat a little bit more. Uh, if you have been down on the river and you're observing things, uh, we would love to hear you share. And so you're welcome to unmute yourself again. If you unmute yourself, I will call on you. Uh, and I might call on Wenix a little bit, uh, but I first wanted to say, ask if the speakers had anything that they wanted to kind of share again, knowing, you know, uh, having seen all of these presentations. Um, I think if it's all right, I'll, I'll jump in there real quick. Uh, one thing I think I forgot to note uh, with my presentation is that although I was focused on the Umatilla Basin, these same conditions are what we're predicted to see throughout the mid-Columbia. So everything that I talked about for the Umatilla Basin, we're likely to see out there throughout the mid-Columbia. And um, I did have an example of the, when I said thermal barriers that I didn't really elaborate on, but a really good example of that, if everybody remembers the big sockeye die-off like Bud was talking about, um, we there was a thermal barrier in the rivers that um, are tributaries into the Columbia, and they were just too warm. So the sockeye just sat there. They didn't want to go into their home rivers. They just sat there and spread diseases and got sick and died. And we lost a huge proportion of those fish. And then we also lost those long-lived sturgeon from all the salmon poisoning. So that's that's what I meant by thermal barriers. Thank you, that's a great cl clarification. Um, so Les Naylor, you wrote something in the chat and I would love it if you would open your mic and explain a little bit more. I know you have expertise in this area. Yeah, I was just pointing out that, so we do steel spawn surveys and ground long evolution nut spawning surveys. And, um, we find lamprey reds and they tend to spawn in between those two periods. So when we're doing our pre spawn mortality surveys for Chinook, we're finding the lamprey reds. So there's some old, there's some temporal overlap in that there could still be eggs in the gravel from the, um, from the lamprey when the Chinook now spawn. Thank you. That was really good clarification. Um, uh, yep. Um, does anyone else want to share anything? I know we have so many knowledgeable people on the line. I know we have um, people from the Fish and Wildlife Commission. Uh, I might call on uh, Laura Gephardt even to see if she has something that she might want to say from a cryptic perspective. Oh. <laughs> All right. Thanks a lot. Um, no, I just wanted to say these are great presentations and um i definitely learned a lot today and i i just hope you know we can collaborate more in the future with any way that cripfit expertise can help with umatilla and umatilla can definitely help with critfic but um we know there's a lot of work 
to do. So um, just thanks again for everything. Thank you for being here. Um, I'm going to give some space uh, a little bit more. Thank you for dropping that link in the chat to CRITFIC, which is the Columbia River Intertribal Fish Commission. Uh, and uh, really, they do a lot of really uh, intertribal collaboration around fish issues. Uh, and so thank you for being here. Um, and does anyone else have anything that they want to share? I never give it quite long enough. So here is our, our last minute, last opportunity to uh, share what you're seeing on the river. Hi, Colleen, this is Lennox. Um, I just want to say that I really appreciate the presentations. They're really great. I really like uh, what Bud showed and what he had to say. And we really are looking into the ability to get tribal membership down on the big river and how we can do that. And there's a lot of interest in that, um, especially because people are a little bit leery of overstepping and going down there and um, being in places where they're not. And they are really interested, especially our young people. So I'd really like to touch more base with um, Bud and the commission of how we can do that in the future to get started. But I really appreciated um, everything I heard today. I, I, as an educator, I learned quite a bit to help me um, further educate people um, in regards to the the issue. And thank you for everything that you do. I mean, you do so much to further education for um, the tribal community, but then also for uh, non-tribal people who <coughs> might be interested in seeking better ways of doing things. So Aaron, uh, you were unmuted and go ahead, Aaron. Yeah, I just want to also feed on what Winnix was saying about in Bud, both about getting kids out. Um, I've led the lamprey harvest at Willamette Falls for the last couple decades for our tribe. Um, <clears throat> you know, one of the things is that, you know, Willamette Falls can be a dangerous area to be at, but um, I also think it's a great opportunity to learn another way to fish and, and be in another area that we historically, you know, once occupied and we still occupy as we still go down there to these days. And um, I'd like, you know, to set something up to where some of these kids can come down there as well and, and experience harvesting lamprey. But um, over the two decades of being there, um, you know, I've definitely seen the lamprey run, you know, seem to die off down there. There's not as many fish. The first person I went there with was Mike McLeod back in the early, early 90s. And uh, there was just lamprey everywhere. And it took no time at all to to get you know several hundred lamprey to bring back to the community for subsistence and now we're seeing times where um, um, if you're not the first tribe there to fish the site gets fished out and it doesn't provide opportunities for other tribes and so um, those are things that you know i've witnessed myself there is that um, you know it's not just a salmon issue it's it's also a lamprey issue and other species as well and species that we don't think about too a lot of times lamprey are or forgotten, and, and Donna kind of brought this up in her talk about um, in-stream projects, is that if you don't see them, my take home from her was that if you don't see them, you don't think about them. And lamprey are mussels or benthic organisms, and now, thank goodness, our habitat projects are doing a great job about, um, you know, making time to salvage those important fish before they start doing in-stream work, so thanks. Yeah, that's a really great point that out of sight, out of mind really uh, hits lamprey and mussels in a different way. So yeah, I think um, maybe like Bud said, use our all of our senses to really experience and dig down into the sand a little bit more. Uh, so we'll give one opportunity, one last opportunity for those. Uh, Althea, please. Hello, thanks Colleen for organizing all this again. I think it's uh, wonderful that you're doing this. I also wanted to add um, just having Jeremy be a fisheries tech and go up the ladder like that. It it's really amazing uh, the humility I'm hearing with the techs and the bios because uh, there is so much risk involved in their technical work. They go out during these high flood seasons and he would like wade through this waist deep water 
to go check on the lamprey. And I know somebody else in the lamprey crew is doing that right now. And of course, uh, walking on those, um, I don't know, I think they're called traps. And and the thing would like bend all the way up in the water and he'd just walk around it like it was nothing up at Looking Glass Creek. And um, I know all of them are doing that. And it, it's such a risk they put their themselves into to save our first foods. And then the other part is when he was working with uh, Atwai Daryl Thompson, and I can't remember who else was there, but a landowner actually like threatened their lives with a gun to try to get him out of the river. And so I know he's not the only one in fisheries that this has happened to in season after season, year after year our techs and scientists go out there to try to save our first foods. So a lot of humility and thank you to all of them. Thank you, Althea. That is an excellent thing to remember is that this work is not without risk and the people that do it do it because they have a love and a passion and a, a drive to protect these foods. I think uh, Jeremiah, it was great I, when I was talking to you early on, you said that this is the job that you've always wanted. Uh, that you're living the life that you always wanted and that was really inspiring to me uh, and I think that others in your colleagues might feel the same way uh, and so I just wanted to open it up again one last time for anybody that wants to share anything other than that is we're gonna move to wrap up can you hear me yes please go ahead yeah I just like to uh, thank everybody and uh, yeah we need uh, yeah we can maybe the we can get our emails going and start getting this started because you know, spring's just right around the corner here. You know, two months we'll be fishing. And uh, yeah, and Aaron, I still always say, don't forget about the lamprey. All right, thank you. Appreciate that, bud. Thank you, everybody. And I think that that's a really good place to end off unless somebody like st shouts that they want to um, speak. Uh, and I just wanted to thank you all again for um, your amazing expertise and your experience that you brought here today and for being here. Thank you to presenters. Thank you for um, sharing all of your knowledge. Uh, Donna, I see that you're off mute. Would you like to say something? Oh, I just wanted to say thank you to you, Colleen, for putting this all together and giving me the opportunity to speak today. So thank you. Ah, it ain't nothing. Uh, I'm just really excited to again learn from all of you guys. Like I learn something new every time I listen to you talk and you're all very inspiring. Uh, thank you again. Uh, I want to just put in a plug again for uh, we have another webinar in two weeks. So on Friday, January 22nd, we will be talking about climate and big game. And so we'll be having a conversation around our deer and elk and bighorn sheep species and the way that they're being impacted by climate change. And so um, that's the same place, uh, same, well, it's a different link we'll send out, um, but it will be Friday, uh, uh, January 22nd, 1 to 3 p.m. Uh, and we look forward to having you there. Uh, Donna, did you want to say something else or uh, are we just not muting? Oh, um, I was just going to say thanks, for, thanks to everybody for attending, but I just typed it since you were being so long-winded. <laughs> it's true, I can go on and on. I'm sorry about yeah. that. <laughs> yes. Thank you again for everybody attending. Uh, and again, just lastly, uh, everybody that attended is going to have their names put into a raffle for uh, air quality monitor. Uh, they're pretty cool, actually, little deals. Uh, I have one in my house that I've been beta testing, and it's fast become my favorite little gadget. So I look at it every time I enter the room, and it's provided a surprising amount of information as to uh, things that I do in my house that impact air quality and kind of the way that outside air quality will feed into uh, my own home. And so uh, the, the speakers are all saying thank you in the chat. Uh, and I want to just say thank you again all for being here and we'll see you in two weeks time. So thank you. Thanks again. Bye. Bye. So I'm going to stop the recording.